One of the groups the internet loves to cringe at the most, and one they've been cringing at for decades at this point, is furries. What started as a minuscule fandom dating all the way back to the 80s has grown considerably in the digital age, with the largest in-person convention, Midwest Fur Fest, garnering 11,000 attendees, and people have taken notice. Most of the mockery is in good fun, and the general sentiment seems to be live and let live that consenting adults can be a little eccentric if they want to. But it's no secret the community has had its fair share of scandals over the years, which it has garnered considerable negative attention for. Names like Hypnotist Sappho and Kiro the Wolf come to mind. Many of these scandals have involved furries being exposed as zoophiles or zoosadists, or outright admitting it themselves and trying to push for the acceptance of zoophilia. I am a zoophile. You did not mishear that. I am a zoophile. I do not have a thing for humans. I am more attracted to dogs like German shepherds. This comes as no surprise, and it isn't hard to imagine why these kinds of people would be attracted to the furry fandom. Other questionable fetishes that are a part of this subculture have drawn everything from ridicule to ire from those outside of it. It's when these situations cross the line from someone's fetish or fantasy to actual real-life incidents involving abuse of real people or animals that things go from just cringe to outright abhorrent. The juvenile appearances of fursuits and often bubbly personalities of the people donning them just makes these situations all the more dark, when something so sinister could be hiding just beneath the surface. But before I go any further, this video is brought to you by today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering awesome boxes of top shelf goods from under the radar brands. It's free to join and you can skip a month or cancel any time. Every month, they introduce their members to cool new products, outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goods, clothing, and more. All you have to do is fill out a preference quiz and they'll let you know which boxes would best fit your personality. Every box has around $70 worth of goods inside, but costs you only a fraction of the value. You'll get a preview of what comes inside to decide if you like it, want to swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. Bespoke Post sent me the Forge, the Billy, and the Parked boxes. The Forge box came with this really cool knife and a leather sheath, which feels very high quality. The Parked box includes this awesome camping chair, which is super easy to transport around in this little bag and is surprisingly comfortable. And the Billy box comes with a camping coffee maker, a portable wood burning stove, fire starter, and a camp kitchen cleaning kit. To get 20% off your first box, click the link in the description and enter Turkey Tom 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash Turkey Tom 20. Okay, now back to the video. Cord Kitty is a fursuiter based out of California. The 36-year-old, whose real name is Gabriel, first became interested in the furry fandom during high school, and has been an active member of the community since the late 2000s, interacting on websites such as Fur Affinity, and attending dozens of conventions in person. His Wikifur page, yeah, there's a furry-specific Wikipedia, if you can believe that, contains a description of his Cord Kitty persona, the backstory of which has also been illustrated in a comic. Cord Kitty was originally a human male named Chris. Chris was cursed when he ran over a cat during a drunken after-party drive. That unnamed cat had a karma spell which cursed Chris. The spell made Chris have to become Cord Kitty. With no memory of her previous human form, Cord's personality is playful, curious, cheeky, and sly. On his YouTube channel, which boasts 11,000 subscribers, he started uploading videos of fursuit dance competitions as early as 2013, some of which have hundreds of thousands of views. However, his interest in both furry conventions and dance competitions wouldn't end in just being a spectator. He was eventually able to scrounge up enough money to commission a suit based on his persona, which he donned at Anthrocon 2014, and looks like the offspring of the Monsters Inc. Yeti and Ori Chef. Using this fursuit, he went on to compete in dance contests himself, totaling 30. And to this day, he still uploads videos of himself dancing to Skrillex, with unbecomingly tight jeans. 
Holy God, what are you showing, you showing me? He started making serious waves at conventions, though probably not in the way he intended to. You see, Cord is something of an anthropomorphic renaissance man. He not only dances, but also composes and sings music, as seen on his Bandcamp page. He even produced a few songs for a fursuiter musical, which was performed at Biggest Little Fur Con 2018. There is a video of the nearly one hour long performance, again, on his YouTube channel. Anyhow, back in the day, he performed the Stinky Fursuit song at Midwest Fur Fest 2014. The title speaks for itself, referring to those furries who don't have the best hygiene practices. But in the comments, we actually see someone accusing Cord of the same thing. Take your own advice and clean your suit, Cord. Could it be that he was the stinky one all along? It turns out that he was getting a lot of complaints about an odor emanating from his suit. At Fandoms United 2015, someone left a note on his door with an arrow pointing to his name, just saying, stinks. And attendees of other cons took to Tumblr to voice their grievances. I saw Cord Kitty's suit at Further Confusion 2016's Headless Lounge. They were airing it out this last weekend and Shudders. That thing stunk so bad that nearly everyone was shoved up against the other side of the room. The poor thing was unbrushed and grimy to the max. I really wish the suit was washed beforehand. Different Anon, Cord Kitty's suit is fucking disgusting. He never washes it or brushes it. He was at Rainforest and it smelled so horrid. Whoever said that the one picture that was submitted was a bad picture doesn't know the truth. I avoided him at all costs during that con while in the suit because I was debuting my suit and did not want him to hug me. Cord seemed to have taken notice of these allegations about the stench. People are popping up saying my suit does indeed smell at cons. This is extremely disturbing to me. I've already utilized all the advice. Someone just told me that one daily shower every morning isn't sufficient to smelling good at a furry con if you're a fursuiter. True? My fursuit popped up on Dirty Grimy Fursuit's Tumblr again. I suck at drying my fursuit at cons. Makes a smell. They assume it's uncleaned. Uh-oh. Stinky. His suit must have been Lovecraftian, insanity-inducing levels of rancid if he couldn't even meet the hygiene standards of a bunch of furries. That, or this guy, is the real-life Michael Afton, literally rotting inside of his suit so bad that even cleaning it properly can't undo the putrefied stink he's got going on. This relatively innocent, albeit amusing run-in with the fursuit odor police wouldn't even be the beginning of the community's complaints about him, though. In a video taken at Biggest Little Fur Con 2022, which was held in June, there is audible booing from the crowd when he comes on stage to dance. This is the story of how his reputation fell so low. In 2015, Gabe started dating fellow fursuiter Bun Bun, real name Deborah. They would continue dating that year until 2016, when he would propose to her at Furlandia, by which point she was also already pregnant. They would end up getting married at another furry convention, and of course, the bride's father wore cat ears. There was a furry groomsman, and the marriage was officiated by a furry priest. Welcome to the future, ladies and gentlemen. I just hope we also get suicide booths like in Futurama. They seemed like a perfect fit for each other's, well, uh, quirkiness. Yeah, these really did not age well. But it wasn't long before they attracted negative attention onto their newly formed family. For some reason, in 2018, Cord Kitty thought it wise to bring his infant son to a baby fur meetup. Or try to, anyways. He also commissioned baby fur art of his son, or I should say, the fursona he made of his son. For you to grasp why this is a big problem, you need to fully understand the context of the situation. So, if you've managed to be lucky enough to get through your life until this point without learning what a baby fur is, then uh, allow me to ruin that for you. Baby furs are furries who roleplay as babies, or very young toddlers. On the sexual side, this subculture has overlapped with ABDL, or adult baby diaper lovers, since they fetishize diapers and, uh, <laughs> all the things that happen within diapers. There's inevitably a connection to age play, and yes, pedophilia, such as sexualized drawings of baby animals. So, safe to say, bringing an actual baby to a baby fur meetup is extremely inappropriate, for the same reason you wouldn't bring one to a lolly convention, if that were a real thing. Which I hope it isn't. But that wouldn't stop Cord Kitty from trying to explain it all away just one year after the fact. You see, in 2019, Gabe and Deb's marriage had already come to an end after three short years. And around the same time, they were facing considerable scrutiny on Kiwi Farms for the aforementioned actions, among other things. In light of this, Gabe decided to go onto Kiwi Farms to defend himself. He started off by posting artwork he commissioned of his other, even more newborn son's persona. 
So apparently, the last time I got my son a commission of his persona, this thread freaked out and lost their shit. Well, I just had a second son, and here is the second commission. He goes on to reveal the fact that he and his wife, now ex-wife, brought his son to a multitude of furry conventions, and intends to bring his other son to more. Furry convention, don't bring the kids! We've brought Damien to BLFC 2017, Califer 2017, Paw 2017, FC 2018, Vancouver 2018, TFF 2018, and BLFC 2018. We intend to bring him and my other son to a bunch more cons, because there is nothing wrong with it. I don't understand this helicopter parent mindset where it's my responsibility to protect him from seeing any and all things that don't seem Judeo-Christian enough. TLDR, don't bring kids into fetish groups thinking it's okay. Baby fur isn't a fetish group. It's people who chose a baby fursona. Yes, they have their weirdos and pedo bears, obviously, but it is possible to be a baby fur and not be into baby rape, just like it's possible to be a furry without being into animal rape. But onto the question at hand, which someone asks, why did you get caught trying to take your baby to a baby fur panel a year ago? He responds, the hilariousness of seeing the faces of the baby furs at a real baby showing up would be priceless. Though, I understand the average furry assumes that all baby furs are pedophiles who rape babies. I still think it'd be hilarious to see the faces of those baby furs if I brought my kids in. That'd be so funny, but I scrapped the idea when people started posting about call CPS. There is literally absolutely nothing wrong with taking my kids to a baby fur room party. You just assume they're all pedophiles because of bias. I've been saying this for years. Baby furs are to furries as furries are to non-furries. They're needlessly mocked and accused of being fetishists, which only intensifies their tribalism. I'm not trying to white knight baby furs, I'm just telling the truth. You're not trying to white knight baby furs? Could have fooled me, since you're so adamant about the fact that they totally aren't fetishists. When I mean, uh, <laughs> come on, bro. He was even following multiple baby fur accounts on Twitter at the time, specifically not safe for work cub accounts, which are just the worst thing ever, by the way. So he was obviously playing dumb about not knowing the true nature of what he was trying to involve his son in. He then switched narratives a year later in 2020 when he posted again to claim he never intended to bring his son in and it was all a joke. You were literally going to physically take him into the baby fur event as part of the joke. Man, I have no recollection of typing that. Damn, I embarrassed myself. Oh well. Well, I sure screwed up. Look guys, I'm sorry about this. I have absolutely no recollection of typing that part. Gosh, did I fuck up. But, important to note, the fact still stands, I never tried to bring my son to a baby fur party. I never went to the party floor. I didn't even watch him during that con. My ex did. I've been protecting him from danger. I do all the things a parent ought to do. I cover the outlets. I never leave him with strangers. I've never brought him near any dangerous situations at any time. I never tried to bring him near any baby furs. And I never even talked to any baby furs at BLFC. Ask anyone that was there. But no one's accusing him of trying to bring his son to a baby fur meetup at BLFC. Because that took place May of 2018. His tweets about bringing his son to the meetup were in January, during Further Confusion 2018. I hope you've memorized the names of all these different furry conventions by now. They will be on the test. His mysterious motives for defending this obscure subgroup of furries became a little clearer when we look at a couple clues he may be a baby fur himself. Well, I guess it's hard to call them clues when it's really him just proclaiming it from the rooftops. He performed a musical skit called Crinkle Wag, crinkle referring to the sound that diapers make when you walk around in them. He remarked about it on Twitter. I've been super disappointed that after making a baby fur rock song skit five months ago, I haven't received a single comment from any baby furs. Someone remarks, uh, maybe that is a good thing. We all know how fur affinity treats that side of the fandom. He responds with, hashtag baby fur lives matter. He has way more tweets though. Oh no, all out of diapers. Messages 10 baby furs, hashtag your network is your net worth. Hey, who wants a swaggy bro hoof crinkle wag? Hopefully no one. He posted baby fur art of his fursona to his fur affinity account and was even in a telegram baby fur chat. But of course he denies it was him. Yet this is all relatively innocuous compared to the other information people dug up, like his F list or fetish list, which he created all the way back in 2009. It includes, but is not limited to, age play, inexperienced partners, risk of pregnancy, extreme pregnancy, zoophilia, 
and barbed wiener, like cat dick. And his persona is also, of course, a cat. So it's not necessarily a reach in my eyes to put two and two together and figure out that this guy clearly wants to bust it down sexual style on mittens, a la Shane Dawson. Meow. Uh, meow. Hey there, kitty. Meow. Meow. <sighs> meow. <sighs> meow. <sighs> meow. Uh, Wait, what? Meow. Uh, the inclusion of age play further suggests he's into baby fur material, which makes this situation with his son all the more disturbing. Even in the perfect scenario, where furry conventions are a totally innocent activity for people who just like pretending to be dogs, for you, it's a fetish. And you probably shouldn't bring your infant children into your fetish. Just a suggestion. A lot of incriminating facts were exposed in the wake of the custody battle, as both Gabriel and Deborah were trying to prove that the other was unfit to be a parent. And one such piece of information were these strange pages that Gabe had bookmarked on his computer, being a guide to sex with dogs, a site called Dog Yif Questions, and a zoo sadist page. Now, he did have an excuse. He only bookmarked that first one to investigate abnormal psychology, of course. However, that becomes a tough sell once it turns out he commissioned art of his persona, a female feral cat, being, um, involved with dogs. In a Telegram chat, he tried to explain these actions, at the same time mentioning the divorce proceedings with his wife. Do you ever like to save effed up links? Like, links that are the most effed up shit you've ever seen? Have you seen this shit before? But you know what? After I bookmarked it, she screen capped it and sent it to all her friends seeing, see, this is proof court is a zoo file. I remember first finding out about the link when someone told me about the Dolphin Rape Caves Google Maps link. Talk about regrets, lol. Hindsight is 2020. She took all of these to court and said, see, he's showing the kids pornography in snuff films. At the same time, the last time he had signed on to his F-list page was 2015. So even after having done this research on zoophilia, he still decided to keep the kink on his list. Later on in 2020, when this information was brought to the attention of the public, he removed any age-related fetishes from his F-list but again, kept zoophilia. I guess that one was so important to him, he just couldn't bear to part ways with it. He tried, in vain, to explain all of this again in March of 2022. Basically, if you were to interpret it as being wise, it sounds, it sounds like animal abuse, but if you were to interpret it as being human, it would actually perfectly match my persona backstory, which is about basically a, a kind of a, a douchebag named Chris, who then turns into a cat, and then is kind of stuck in that body and then has to spend the rest of their life in that body because they um, because they went out drunk driving and then killed a cat and, and that cat had a curse on them, the, the karma curse. So basically he had to give to the world what he took away. He basically uh, took away a life, so he had to give that life back. And that's the reason why, um, that's the whole uh, foundation of the backstory. So I was thinking uh, a human sepient. So the idea of like a human inside of like a, a feral quadruped. So that's where that came from. Pretty much my whole F list, it's literally just based off of that backstory and the idea of that backstory. If you're not following his mental gymnastics here, and who can blame you, he's claiming that because his persona is a human who then transformed into an animal, sexual acts wouldn't truly be zoophilia. As for the age play kink, his persona is a four-year-old because he just had to convert human years to cat years. It's the classic lolly defense. I know she looks seven, but she's actually a 2,000 year old vampire. He just likes to fantasize about him being a cat in heat. What's so wrong about that? He even confessed to watching cat mating videos in a telegram group called Cats NSFW, saying that he was embarrassed to admit he did. But he of course later stated that he was referring to anthro, or anthropomorphic cats. Not real cats, silly. Typical trolls, am I right? It doesn't make sense for him to be embarrassed when the whole point of the group chat is sexualizing anthro cats. It seems more likely that he was indeed watching videos of real cats getting it on. It's not a zoophile thing though, since surely while he views these videos, he's inventing a headcanon about how the cats are actually transformed sapient humans. Again, the number one most popular fantasy of all women is to be raped. This is according to Louis H. Janda, an associate professor of psychology at Old Dominion University. If fantasy is intent, then that means most women are into being raped. You must be intellectually consistent. If fantasy is intent, then that means, one, most women are into being raped. Two, I am into fucking cats. Both statements are equally false because fantasy is not intent. Fantasy is simply an idea which turns someone on. You know for a fact that most women are not into being raped, so you must conclude that I'm not into fucking cats. If this isn't copypasta worthy, I don't know what is. 
Of course, he admits the facts that rape fantasies are just the most common abnormal fantasy, meaning the majority of women don't have them. But even if what he was saying was true, most women don't commission art of themselves being raped, yet he commissions zoophilia art. What are we supposed to make of that? In another chat, he mentioned how his own mother showed him a bestiality video, leading some to question whether this is a family thing. My mom showed me a bestiality video once, no joke. It was the funniest shit ever. Some friggin' woman had a horse in her mouth, and she choked. It was so fucked up. That's why I have the chillest family in the world. We laugh at dumbasses. But yes, animal abuse is horrific. He pulled yet another fantastic explanation out of his magician's hat for this one. Am I uh, really sure? Again, with this one, is it's against again and against the rules. My mom showed me a bestiality video once. No joke, it was the funniest shit ever. So, the, so, the, so before that, wait, hold on. I, I just need to read it because like it, it's like one of your friends went. Uh, okay, I, I assume that's out of confusion. Some woman freaking had a for horse in her mouth and she choked. It was so fucked up. That's why I have the chillest family in the world. We laugh at dumb at we laugh at dumb asses. But yes, animal abuse is horrific should i pm this dude i like i would be like stop it so no more misbehaving and sending animal abuse i must repeat this i have the chillest dude in my family the sorry chillest coolest family in the world excuse me they don't give any fucks and i'm like so is this a family thing uh no so basically okay let me first rewind so what kiwi farms does is it takes everything i've ever said on the internet and cherry picks and I could add context to everything, but you have to be patient because obviously there's a lot of stuff. So oh, with how? that, I'm, I'm confused. How? So I, so with that one particular comment, one thing I realized was I forgot to talk about the part where the woman was sitting on a bench while this was happening and fell backwards. And that's why it was funny. Now I understand. Why didn't he just say this before? I mean, we've all been there. You're in your room, sitting at your computer, and your mom waddles in, phone in hand, to show you an instant karma bestiality video she found on Facebook. And you're like, well, mom, that's fascinating, as she giggles like a schoolgirl. Doesn't get much more relatable than that. That's some classic sitcom family humor. I think I remember that episode on Full House. I don't even know if it's Cord Kitty anymore or I'm watching a Fresh Prince episode. Oh, and who could forget all of the funny horse porn blooper compilations that get posted everywhere? Can't go five minutes on the internet without seeing one of those. Believe it or not, there's still more family shenanigans to go around. Literally four days ago, my father complimented me and said that the furry porn I drew when I was 16 looked very good. Isn't that amazing? Weird enough of a statement as that is, it gets weirder when you're aware of what exactly the drawing in question is of. In 2002, my parents found a drawing I made of Calvin and Hobbes and Bambi. In 2002, he would have been 16. So, the NSFW drawing his father congratulated his son on was of a six-year-old having sex with his stuffed tiger. Lucky for us, we don't need to stick to pure speculation on this topic, since Deb herself would later post surprising claims on her own Kiwi Farms account about the circumstances surrounding the divorce. One of the many reasons I left Gabriel is that I walked in on him allowing Hago, the family dog, to lick peanut butter off his dick. He later admitted to me multiple times he had sex with dogs. Truthfully, the longer I stayed married to him, the quicker I wanted out. I only stayed as long as I did out of peer pressure from my friends telling me that it was the correct thing to do for the children. I wish I left him way sooner than I did, to be honest. He has done nothing for me, except being a huge burden financially and a source of constant annoying drama. Well, I guess the cat is out of the bag. Or rather, the cat has its bag out and the dog is going at it. Unfortunately for Hagao, it appears she has been returned to Gabe in exchange for Deb's belongings. Being Cord Kitty's dog must have been so stressful, Hago seems to have taken it out on a random mouse, which Gabe weirdly gloated about and publicized on his Twitter. My dog is officially a murderer! She ripped the leg off a helpless mouse and I watched it die. R.I.P. Random Mouse. Oh wait, I think my dog killed a mole rat. I got video of it too. It's disturbing. Wanna see it? Now, maybe I'm not as well versed in interacting with animals as Mr. Kitty is, but it's not exactly the most normal thing to do to immediately have an impulse to show everyone the carcass of a dead animal to strangers online. In any event, I hope that Hago gets a better home to be in, as no one deserves to live with this madman looming over them. 
All of this questionable info prompted people to dig deeper and see if he had any other ties to zoophilia or even pedophilia. He was friends with and following some pretty alarming individuals on Twitter, and the autists on Kiwi Farms graciously provided a list. I hope you'll enjoy the juxtaposition between the ridiculous and heinous crimes that these people have committed. General Folfi One, a self-admitted zoo sadist who had a Beast Forum account, which was a bestiality board, and posted on several other forums, soliciting people to have sex with their dogs. He was Gabe's roommate in Washington Heights. Despite being aware of the Beast Forum account, Gabe was still following him on Twitter as of June 10th, 2021. Kintari, an ex-veterinary technician who rapes dogs. Gabe remained friends with him up to 2019, in spite of proof of him being a zoo leaking, which happened in 2015. Foxler Nightfire, a zoophile dating a pedophile. He was on trial for sexual misconduct with a minor, and presumably became friends with Gabe sometime around 2009 to 2010, through the game Second Life. They were still frequently in touch with each other on Telegram as of 2021. ZJ Wolf, a zoo sadist who had sex with his dog, and was fired from his job at the pet store because of it. Gabe allegedly blocked him after reading the Kiwi Farms thread about ZJ's crimes. We can see that this was a lie though, since Gabe was caught talking to him in January of 2022. Lavadog Ashpaw, sentenced to 25 to 40 years in prison for raping a boy under the age of 13. His arraignment was in 2016, and Gabe was still in contact with him up until his sentencing in 2018. Toast the Rabbit, arrested in 2016 for receiving, distributing, and possession of CP. Cord Kitty's other associates include Andrew K, admitted to possession and distribution of CP and sexually assaulted a minor. Spark Dalmatian, convicted of child molestation and possession of CP and a self-admitted friend of Gabe's. Dan Rook Ruface, convicted of statutory rape and possession of CP. Crusader Cat, admitted to raping his cat on his own YouTube channel in 2009. Gabe had a sleepover with him in 2012 and refused to believe that he raped his cat, even though Gabe favorited zoo porn directly from Crusader Cat's fur affinity page. Crusader Cat also recorded the video where Gabe first debuted his fursuit. Jason Effects, pedo zoophile, groomed his 15-year-old girlfriend into performing boy stubs for a porn comic. Gabe allowed him into a private chat group and banned someone else for telling him that he was a creep after he told the person it was okay to fuck kids. Obviously, allowing someone to advocate having sex with children in your chat and then banning people for being rude when they call them out is horrific. RC Fox, arrested for possession and distribution of over 50 pieces of illegal materials. He committed suicide in March 2018 after accepting a plea deal. He appears to have been in contact with Gabe as early as 2015 and Gabe defended RC and berated people for mocking his suicide. Glow Fox. You may remember this name from the Zoo Sadist leaks, which were leaks of a Zoo Sadism telegram chat, which many furries were a part of. He was exposed for potentially raping an 11-year-old boy when he was 18 and violently orally raping his dogs. He wanted to attend underage sex parties hosted by Snake Thing, the owner of the chat, and he traded various photos and videos of bestiality back and forth with Snake Thing. He was invited into Gabe's private telegram group in August of 2021, but Gabe claims that he didn't know. I guess he didn't know about any of the other people I just mentioned either, including his roommate. One of the defenses Cord Kitty had used before trying to take his son to the baby fur meetup was that none of his friends had been convicted of a crime. But this is just blatantly false, which we can see with all of the people we just went over. Lavadog Ashpaw, Spark Dalmatian, Dan Rook Ruface, Toast the Rabbit, R.C. Fox, Foxler Nightfire, all of these sick freaks have been documented having cub art on their fur affinity or ink bunny pages. There's a couple more degenerates that Cord Kitty had a special connection to, which brings us to Rainforest 2015. You may have heard about this convention before from the Internet Historian video about it, which details the incredible amount of damage its attendees inflicted upon the hotel venue, including the baby furs that left diapers everywhere. And uh, this guy, who seems to have, to use the proper terminology, messed in his diaper, just living his best life. Anyhow, Cord Kitty put together some skits at Rainforest 2015, and he invited a fursuiter named Growly in two of said skits. In this video, Growly is the one guiding the people to his chair, and in this one, it's just him and Gabriel's ex-wife Bun Bun on stage. Growly is a twice convicted pedophile that has been in the community since 1999. His first conviction was in 2001 when he and his boyfriend, another furry by the name of Steelheart Burren, raped a 14-year-old multiple times over the course of three months. In 2009, he also tried soliciting a minor for nudes on Fur Affinity. He has been banned from multiple conventions because of all of this, but none of that bothered Gabriel, apparently, 
who claims he kept Growly around to use his audio equipment for Deborah's music. In a moment of brilliance, Gabe also tried to share a room between himself, his wife, his infant son, and, of course, Growly at Califer 2017. Then, later on in 2019, surprising absolutely no one, Growly was charged with possession of CP, and it was only at that point that Gabe ceased being friends with him. It's unclear whether he did this on principle, or if he just wanted to improve his image for the sake of the custody battle. Oh, and it's worth mentioning that both Growly and his pedo boyfriend Steelheart also were big fans of cub artwork. Coincidentally, I'm sure. Another character that Cord Kitty was particularly involved with was Kalyu Furret, or Nick, a pedophile Zusadist artist. The two met each other in 2009 on Pounce.org, a now defunct furry social networking site that shut down in 2018. Nick told Gabe of vague accusations about himself related to sexual assault and Zusadism in 2011. This was further corroborated by a local meat organizer who said they had just recently banned him over it, but Gabe remained friends with him anyways. Nick introduced himself to Deb sometime in 2015 and began initiating a cuckold relationship between himself, Deb, and Gabe. Gabe, Deb, Nick, and Gabe's son roomed together at Califer 2017. Deb left Gabe for Nick in 2019. They actually lived together for several months, and Nick gave her a loan for legal fees in the custody dispute. There's no way I can really close this section off other than remark about how disturbing it is to know that all of these convicted sex offenders, pedophiles, zoophiles, and zoo sadists were regularly attending fur cons and getting away with it. Truly disturbing. In April of 2020, Facebook messages were leaked showing that Gabe had inappropriate contact with a minor. These messages took place all the way back in 2014, when he was 27 years old and she was 17, 10 years his junior. It was technically legal, but the age gap and her evident vulnerability made the whole thing reprehensible. The messages read bottom to top, and it's become immediately evident that he repeatedly steered the conversation into sexual topics. He talked about lewd art he wanted to commission of their two personas, which he eventually did commission. He even gave her advice on losing her virginity, which is an obvious red flag for how much less experienced she is than him. Their interactions weren't limited to online conversations, though. Gabe was intent on meeting up with her and getting naked in front of her, to which she responds, I don't know. No boy has ever gotten that far with me. I wouldn't really know what to do. So he says, okay, I'll keep fapping. See ya. Eventually, he must have gotten his way because later on they talk about the experience, specifically her being scared about his exposed genitals. She also expresses her apprehension towards sexual activity in general. Considering the bad prior experiences she's had with guys, specifically her mom's boyfriend who supposedly tried to rape her. She specifically states her worry that Gabe will do the same. I guess, to be honest in my mind, all I see is me seeing it and then you getting the wrong idea and having your male urges take over your body but he tries to rationalize her out of this line of thinking and convince her he's trustworthy, obviously so he can get what he wants. He says, Oh no, I think that's something Dom guys do. I'm more of a switch slash sub. And if that happened, you should kick me in the balls and then run away and never return, right? If any guy or anyone tries to rape you, kick them in the balls, poke their eyeballs, and run, run, run. She responds, Heh, yeah, you're right, but still, I have this feeling inside me that something bad will happen to me at your house today, and as much as I try, I can't shake the feeling. She was even having nightmares about sex, but of course, he keeps trying to coerce her. Well, the good news is I'm giving you 100% control over what you want me to show. You can say, no, keep it in there, and I will. Or you can say, um, okay, I'll see it, and I'll be like, okay. The fact that he's using such infantile language to discuss such a mature topic and situation just screams grooming, and calls attention to the clear facts that the person he's trying to engage in sexual behavior with is not ready for it. This is another one of those things that he tried, in vain, to defend himself for on Kiwi Farms. My entire life, I believed the don't have sex with people more than a 10 year age gap difference, and that's all. It's one of those subjects literally no one has ever talked to me about. I hadn't seen any posts about it. Simply put, a local furry said they were yiffy on social media, and I talked to them about it. Mutual flashing happened. That's the worst of it. We watched Princess Mononoke, ate pizza, and I invited other furs over to watch movies and hang out too. I didn't try to hide any information about that. We're still friends. In response to a call-out thread about him on Twitter, Gabe messaged someone in February 2022 trying to explain his actions. His defense basically boils down to claiming his friends and family saw nothing wrong with what he did, but considering the fact that his friends are all sex offenders, his dad liked his furry drawn CP, and his mom watches horse porn, sorry, horse porn comedy videos, 
I don't think their moral input means much. At the same time, he makes the bold claim that he never asked her to do anything sexual at all. You're telling me you and your parents see no issue with emotionally and sexually taking advantage of a minor? One who confided in you? An adult whom they put their trust in when they were already previously sexually exploited by another adult? To be perfectly honest, my point of view was, this person is the legal age of consent, it's their choice. I felt perfectly moral because everything was legal and nothing in my life experience would tell me otherwise. And still, no one is telling me there is anything wrong with it, including my friends and family. He exposes just how warped his perception is when he talks about her being the one in control, since she was a strong independent black girl living in a dangerous neighborhood and dealing with drugs from a young age, ignoring the parts where she talked about being abused. He probably should have taken these things as red flags, that this girl, who wouldn't even have been out of high school yet, might have been psychologically scarred, rather than quote unquote, domineering. I don't feel like I exploited her because all I had from her was friendship, a friendship which lasts till today. She was flirty, more domineering, I was more submissive, and I was going with the flow. Neither of us felt uncomfortable at all. I mean, she needs to be domineering. She was a proud black woman living in one of the most cutthroat boroughs, and she was a drug dealer as well, unsure when she started dealing drugs. She was in control the whole time, and my goal was to make sure I was as chill and normal as humanly possible. The person he was talking to responded, Oh, buddy, you just made things so much worse for yourself. You do realize that adultification within the black, if not just POC, community is rampant, right? Even the way you describe her as a minor is hypersexualized. You think it's fucking cool that a child was a drug dealer? Do you really think she was cutthroat? Or maybe, just fucking maybe, she had to put on a tough front in order to deal with her trauma, something you are now plainly admitting to exploiting. Oh, and uh, while he was at it, he did more horse porn apologetics just for the fun of it. Your mom showed you horse bestiality and you thought it was funny? What was funny about it was that the woman choked and fell backwards. The karma was the funny part. A lot more of their explicit convos moved over to Skype, so we don't have access to those. And it's unclear whether he engaged in these kinds of conversations with any other teens. But three months before this incident, he uploaded a video called My Little Pony Boar, at the end of which he wished a happy 18th birthday to someone named Shade, which meant he had to be interacting with at least one other minor. Some others on Twitter claimed to have interacted with Cord Kitty while they were minors, but we don't have much evidence beyond that. OMFG, Cord Kitty. This is bringing back old memories of YouTube in 2016. He used to talk with me on there when I was 12 or something. He didn't say anything sus from my experience, but it's still hella weird now that I look back at it how he would constantly message me, lol. Cord used to chat with me on Facebook, back when I joined the fandom at 16 slash 17 years of age, and he just came off as a creep. This unhinged madman just couldn't keep himself from ranting and raving, in the process writing some simply astounding texts. Since none of you have any familiarity with the meaning of the word pedophile, let me teach you. Pedophile, less than 11. Hebophile, 11 to 14. Ephebophile, 15 to 16. Teleophile, 17 or older. Please educate yourself if you can. I'm a teleophile. There, now you've learned the definition of pedophile. Now you'll start using it correctly, right? Huh, I doubt it. Also, let me teach you the definition of the word grooming, since none of you are using it correctly. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, grooming is the criminal activity of becoming friends with a child, especially over the internet, in order to persuade the child to have a sexual relationship. So, according to the Cambridge Dictionary and the Scientific American, all of you aren't using the English language correctly. How sad. Hopefully you'll learn someday, unless you're just purposefully misusing it for the lols, which I'm fairly certain of. With this level of rhetoric, I'm surprised the man hasn't been recruited as a Reddit mod yet. Hey guys, I fact-checked your claim that I'm a pedophile, and actually, Snopes says it's bogus. Turns out I'm a teleophile. That is, if my son doesn't count. In April 2022, he went on a podcast to be questioned on various things, chief among them being what he thinks the age of consent should be, considering this incident. But he has quite an interesting response to what should be a straightforward question. You kind of, you kind of dodged the question. Yeah, um, you dodged it. Give me an age, 1 through 18. Um, I'll just say I don't care. I have no opinion. You don't? You I don't, don't care. care? <laughs> I don't care. You don't care. Uh, you don't care. You're favoriting zoophile porn. 
Um, you're losing your children in custody, Adam. You're a fucking winner in my book. First, he says he thinks the laws are just fine the way they are and implies that his answer is 18. But considering he violated that barrier himself, it doesn't seem he's being quite honest. And when he's asked to give a specific age, he reverts to saying he doesn't care. Really? You don't care what age someone is considered to be able to consent? What if the age of consent was three? Would you care then? He went on Twitter to try to clarify, but only ended up making things look worse for himself. I care very deeply about people following the law, including age of consent laws. What I was saying was, I genuinely don't have any opinions about what age the US government chooses in their legislation. I don't care if they raise or lower it. I have zero opinions on it. Again, I ask, what if they got rid of age of consent altogether? Would you have an opinion then? Obviously, he does have an opinion. He just wants to conceal what it actually is. He messaged the podcast host on Discord to express his displeasure with the flack he was getting. I have zero control over the fact that a thousand plus lies are spread by insecure people. That has been, is, and will be the source of my life problems. Gullible people are murdering Ukrainians right now. They executed Jews during the Holocaust. And right now, they are trying to stop me from making more contributions to the furry fandom. They will lose just like your associates will lose. If I needed to change, then my life would not have the success that it has. Like my favorite actor, Johnny Depp, the problems are external and not internal. And I've chosen to take a stronger effort to not validate my external problems with a response. Good night. Somehow, he managed to compare people hating him for his take on Age of Consent to Holocaust victims, Ukrainians, and Johnny Depp all in the same breath. Now, without any irony or jokes attached, I want to say that these people are real, with real infant children, associating with convicted pedophiles and putting them in danger. Regardless of how much entertainment we can milk out of these little cows, it becomes a serious problem when it spills out and puts innocent safety in jeopardy. It's bad enough for a kid to have to go through their parents' divorce, it's worse when your parents are demented, zoophilic pedophiles who never cease to expose their insanity online, along with pictures of you on their social media accounts, which will follow you forever. Hopefully, this guy's kids come out as unscathed as possible from this whole ordeal. I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.